I'm sorry if I sound rushed, but I want to make sure that you're exactly in the right place. You're about to see over the shoulder of exactly how over the last nine years, I helped software businesses boost their revenue while making them cut their expenses in half. We're talking about any type of software and business model from standalone to software as a service, mobile apps, freemium and premium only from social networks to top school software from logistics and data analytics, the data science and artificial intelligence. Software companies in any stage have been completely turned around once they applied what you're about to hear in this training. From startups like Timely in the event space to Freitera in the logistics and freight space to Hootsuite, the beloved unicorn of investors, to enterprises like Cisco where we help them build this amazing platform for customer service and to Watson Artificial Intelligence Powerhouse to build platform to engage the top data scientists in the world to solve the wildfires that are happening right now across North America. I'm just showing you this because I want you to understand that what I'm showing you is so valuable because it's exactly how I was able to help and grow these companies. On top of these, we've been able to have consistent results over the last nine years, regardless of technology, of pandemics that happened and had everyone working from home. We're able to consistently have these results by sticking to the principle that I'm about to show you. Now, these principles apply to you if you have a new or an existing business. If you're wondering if what I'm about to show you applies only to certain industries or to certain verticals or to cer certain caliber of companies, certain sizes, I can promise you that if you follow these principles, they will help you grow any software business. And in fact, not only software, but any business. Like my client here, who you can see by this graph, that their revenue skyrocketed right away after they implemented these principles. And in fact, today, they reached $16.5 million annualized revenue. And Bradley here, co-founder of Timely, he saw how the productivity of his team turned around completely when he started working with us. Things started coming together and the new process was delivering consistent result. That's only because he allowed us to help him implement the strategies I'm about to teach you. So obviously I'd like you to become one of our clients as well. If after you watch this video and you feel these things can help you and your business, I'll give you a link where you can book a call with me and my team and see if we're a good fit to work together. Now, who am I? My name is Aristotle Daskal, and I'm pretty sure you don't care about my failure to success stories or the fact that I used to be a glorified technical support, and now I'm helping some of the highest technology-enabled companies in the world. But what you should really care about, you should care about the fact that I spent the last 14 years growing and building teams and products, and you're learning from someone with that experience. The experience of someone spending all these years hands-on involved not just by adding certifications over certifications. And while today I do have a very large professional network, I promise you that when I got started and managed my first million dollar project, a kid in college would have more LinkedIn connections than I did. What really matters is how much time I spent in the software business grind and the great results that I got for all these companies. That's why after first hearing about what project management was in the software industry, and after everyone told me that you can only become a project manager and manager developers only if you have between four and six years of experience doing development, I did not accept that. So in just six months, I was able to manage a portfolio of project for the London Olympics in 2012. And it was because I wasn't trying to be an executive figure or to sell overpriced developers like everybody else around me was doing. And I was trying to help people and businesses discover and reach their potential and build businesses that would improve people's lives. And that's how I was able to help all these companies that you're about to hear in this training. These people either had existing businesses when they started working with me or they went all in in starting their business. These are not wannabe entrepreneurs. So just to be clear, these are amazing results, but they are results from people that took this very seriously. If you're a beginner and you're just starting out and you've never built a business before, you probably will not be able to keep up the pace. People in these case studies do not view business as a hobby. They are serious business owners or people very serious about starting a business. And this training is not for total beginners or for people that don't want to spend the money on the tools that they need to grow their business and jump to the next level. But what they do want is to do it faster than they would have done it on their own. If you think you're going to build a million dollar business just using a 97 bucks a month software and a free coaching newsletter, well, I'm sorry, but that's just not realistic. And if that's the case, you may want to exit this video right now. Also, please keep in mind that I'm not saying that you're going to get exactly the same results like me or these clients of mine. 
But what I am suggesting is that I'm going to show you exactly how you can get these results yourself and leave you to decide what you're going to do with that. These are the biggest keys, and I mean non-negotiable keys. You must do these things if you want to grow and scale your software product business into millions or even tens of millions of dollars, revenue or even profit per year. These principles work across the board and in every single niche you can imagine. CRM, wellness, education, logistics, entertainment, relationships, literally every industry you can think of. One of my clients even applied these principles to his photography business, even if it didn't involve any software development. The bottom line is that the digital businesses nowadays is about to hit $325 billion and is growing even faster now that a lot of businesses and a lot of people are working from home and spending money that way. Normally, everyday people like you and me are sitting at home at a desk building businesses that make this kind of money by building and selling software products. So if you're building software products and you're following these three keys, you're going to be doing substantially better than you were doing yesterday and then 99% of the other companies out there, companies that are your competitors. The reason most people fail at building software products is because they're concentrating on the wrong things. They concentrate on things that don't matter. They're going to conferences on two general topics without a real outcome in their mind. They're looking for clients at events where only service providers are actually going. And every now and then, they're trying to learn development, hoping that that's going to save them a lot of money if they try to build a product themselves. At the same time, they're constantly looking to hire and interview new people, believing that the most skilled developers is somehow going to save their product and make them rich. And the little time left, it's split between pitching to investors, getting a little bit of sleep, and then they go home disappointed that they didn't spend time with those that matter the most, their kids, their spouse, their friends. There's a huge difference between chasing all the topics about startups out there and starting from the big picture and following a simple blueprint for building any software business. I promise you that most experts in various areas like finances and accounting and product management and project management and development, most people that you've been listening to up to this point, most probably they don't apply these principles. They don't have a holistic vision of the entire company, of the entire business operation. And they're not doing the things that I'm about to show you. As I continue to help many companies boost their productivity and lower their expenses, my clients were bigger and bigger and they had more and more users, more departments, more clients. So I needed a way to scale all these businesses, to grow all departments and jump up the revenue, to optimize the product planning, to build goals and metrics across all the company and across every single department, and to make sure that the execution is going exactly as it should. So that in a matter of months, I would be able to help any tech company achieve this, doubling revenue while cutting their expenses in half. So over the last nine years, I built and perfected a system that if you check any checkbox in it, will allow a team to get things done without you knowing a single line of code. But not only that, it's a system that my clients implemented to manage their teams without hiring managers and build software way faster. And these two goals allow these businesses to build software much cheaper and much more profitable because they weren't hiring very expensive managers or taking forever to build these products like they used to. And it was also so seamless and so step-by-step -step that I was able to help multiple companies at the same time implement these. And if you want to achieve this too, you have to do exactly the same things that they did and start by visualizing where do you see yourself? Where do you want to get? Where do you want to be in, let's say, six months from now? So I'm going to go ahead and introduce you to these three keys that are going to help you build profitable software businesses really fast. All right, I'm going to go pretty fast, so please make sure you take notes. Number one, how to build products faster with only half the cost. Number two, how to manage developers without knowing how to code and without hiring expensive managers. And number three, why don't you need to beg for funding to skyrocket your revenue? The truth is that you can build profitable software products faster and with only half the cost. In 2012, I was working with this amazing company, a unicorn, that in a few years grew from zero to over $1 billion in valuation. A major new project was starting with the company and I was in charge of it. So I went into a meeting with the director and he said, he said, Aristotle, here we have the internal team and they will support you with a platform related things. Here's a senior developer, 
a lead developer, a junior developer, and a mobile developer. And here are two more engineers that you're gonna need. But you're also gonna be working with that data analytics lead, and then with this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and with all these. And here's the external vendor team. And they have this account manager, they have this project manager, they have this senior developer, they have this junior developer. And after he spent about 10 minutes introducing me to the entire team, I knew he was not gonna like what I'm gonna tell him. So I had to pull him aside so I can talk to him. And I said to him, I said, listen, the amount of time that will take me to manage all these people is more than the amount of time needed for me to build this with a tiny team of people that know what they're doing, that don't require management. And he looked at me like he was thinking, well, this guy must be crazy. And he said, just work with a team that I'm giving you here. And I knew that there was no way I'm gonna help them build within the time frame that they needed and stay within the budget with such a massive team. And after a couple of weeks, it became clear that there's no way that this product is gonna be built in time and nor will it have the quality desired. So I left the project because I didn't wanna get myself attached to something that was doomed to fail. Just because the head of the department just didn't want to listen. I want to contrast this with another company that I worked with. I met with a CEO and this time he was in a way better situation because the CEO had a much better idea. He had two developers, an architect, a product manager, and a development lead. And when I went into his office, he said, okay, Aristotle, so who do we need to hire? We've got the developers, we've got the architect, we've got the product manager, and here's the development lead. So the first thing I need is who do we need to hire to get this done? So I said to the CEO, I said, you don't have to hire a single person. And the CEO gave me the same strange look that the previous director gave me. Only that this time, I didn't have to ask him to fire an entire team. So I said to the CEO, I said, where do you think this project should be in 30 days from now? Where do you want to see this project in 30 days from now? I want to have, he said, I want to have a plan a one-year plan of what we should be doing exactly to turn around this company, to turn around this product. That's what I want to have in 30 days. Give me two weeks, I said. Just give me two weeks. And I will have a complete analysis, a product roadmap, and an entire strategy of how to get this product built only with the existing team within the time frame that you're expecting. And if I can get you that in two weeks instead of 30 days, well, you can fire me or you can hire as many people as you want. But if I can get it done in two weeks, this plan for turning around the product using only the existing team, then you're gonna listen to me and let me help you scale this company. And the CEO put out his hand and agreed. Two weeks later, we had a full strategy, an entire roadmap prepared. And as a bonus, the product was already improved from a rating of 2.6 to 4.2 out of five. But not only did they didn't need to hire additional staff, but out of the current staff, I only needed the two developers. I didn't need the architect. I didn't need the product manager. I didn't need the development lead. And that's because one of the developers could take over the activities of the architect and the development lead. And that product manager, which actually was doing more of a project manager work, would not even be needed because they would apply my blueprint of processes that would not require for such a role. In the next two months, we completely stabilized the current product and we already started working on the next platform, rebuilt from scratch on a scalable architecture. In six more months, we completely rebuilt the product while maintaining the old platform, which was originally built in four years. Now, why did this work? Well, it worked because when you have a smaller team of highly skilled and highly focused developers, even if those developers are more expensive because they're more skilled, the overall cost is lower than an entire team that you think you need. And instead of countless hours managing the developers, all your hours will be spent on building that product. So in the words of Bradley, co-founder of Timely, he said, developers sometimes work in their own little bubble and mindset of this is what I think I need. And that's exactly what we focused on bringing together. That was the disconnect that happened over there before we started working together. And we helped bringing all of it together bringing together what the customers want and what the developers were actually building because that was where the gap was. You may think you need to hire highly skilled developers to build a better product, but the problem that Bradley and many of my other clients had was that they were working on the wrong things, on the wrong features. 
So what I discovered was that you're in fact better off even having only a junior team but coachable and help them build an ownership mindset, a mindset of taking responsibility in their work and pride in what they're doing. With a team like this, you can now completely focus on aligning everybody on what the customers really need. And this is infinitely more valuable than having self-centered, experienced developers that just go off the rails building whatever they think they should build. And believe me, this happens way more often than people think. And such an ownership-based, agile mindset naturally develops a much more productive environment like it did for Genia Beck, co-founder of Freitera.com. Many times our clients are considering remote developers, but although in most cases it's significantly more cost-effective, they give up on the idea. They think that there's no way to properly manage a remote team, like you can manage them in an office. Instead, implementing our blueprint, Bradley was able to lower his costs even more by using remote developers and later support engineers, and that's only because he adopted the right culture together with our processes, communication tools, transparent targets, and reports, which gave him and his entire team complete visibility on the progress of everything that was going on without affecting their autonomy. Actually, the autonomy increased, especially now when so many tech companies are working remotely because they don't have any other option due to this current pandemic. Our blueprint is helping them be confident that their team is delivering the same or even high results now that they're working remote. And as a proof, here's Sasha, one of my clients that was traveling the world while managing her teams, which worked completely remotely, traveling, having fun, but also working hard from Serbia, Croatia, Toronto, to Vancouver, her hometown, Crete, and all over Europe. Now, you may think that you need to build more features to acquire more customers, but instead, we show our clients how to identify and build only those features that address the core, most important, the biggest pain. Like Bradley here, he says, the client bought from us under a promise of a value and we weren't building that vision and I was selling to the client. It's all about validation of what customers are saying that their needs are and what they're actually buying and we failed on that. And that's exactly what together we worked on. See, they were selling an event calendar to their clients so that they can publish their events and their website visitors would save them in their calendars. But the problem was that these clients populated their calendars, were constantly asking for more and more features. So the product would have more and more features but with more bugs. And the worst of all is that they would end up not even using many of the features that they would implement at their request. The transformation came when applying the lean principles, like building minimum viable products or in short MVPs. An MVP is the smallest feature of a product with just one or a very limited set of functionalities meant to bring the highest value possible to the customer in the smallest time to develop. Now, once that MVP is being built, you would then measure to make sure that it brought to the customer the expected value. Only once that value is being confirmed, they would continue with the next iteration of building on top of the previous features. As a result of this transformation, Bradley says, we started winning back the clients that were drifting away and it was a big thing for the company. This is exactly what we worked on together and for them, that was an amazing outcome. The truth is that in order to build a profitable product quickly, you need to learn how to build minimum viable products. But the ultimate profitability comes from building these MVPs by using minimum viable teams. Now, what exactly is a minimum viable team? And how does it help you create the ultimate profitable software business? A minimum viable team is the smallest possible team with the lowest possible operating cost that delivers the highest product quality through an optimal combination of skill, mindset, and efficiency in the shortest timeline or the highest speed while maintaining a happy, motivated, and fulfilled team. Now, you might say, okay, Aristotle, I get it. We got to implement this lean, agile methodology approach and build this minimum viable team in order to see our profits double and our costs get cut in half. But how, how am I going to implement these if I don't know how to code? How will I manage developers if I'm not that technical? So I want to tell you a little story about a guy that was exactly in the same situation. And I'm pretty sure you know him. 
It's Steve Jobs, the CEO of the highest valuated company nowadays, up to $2 trillion. It's the greatest tech company of all time, Apple. And he, Steve Jobs, did not know how to code. And that's something that his co-founder, Wozniak, confirmed. Did you know that the most popular computers that are being used by the best developers around the world right now as we speak are Apple computers? And the CEO and the co-founder of this company did not know how to code. So here's the little story. In 1985, Apple fired Steve Jobs, mainly because of the low profits of the company as he was trying to build this ultimate amazing computer. But in 1997, as Apple has acquired Steve Jobs' startup that was building that supercomputer, he returned to Apple again as CEO. And as he was taking a tour of the Apple campus, he stopped at a design shop, the design shop of this product designer named Joni Ive. Now, Joni was on the brink of quitting Apple because he was so sick of what the company became, being way more focused on just profits than anything that had to do with the top quality that Apple used to be all about. Jobs went into the studio and he looked in the middle of the room and he saw this big monitor and you could see inside it all the cables, mainboard, processor, everything was in there. It was a big monitor, which was a package of computer and the monitor all in one. It was pretty transparent, so you can pretty much see everything that was inside. And this big monitor had a handle. So Jobs looked at the monitor, and then looked at Joni. And Joni looked at Jobs, and looked pretty disappointed down at the monitor. But Jobs was not disappointed. Right there in that room, he saw something that most of Apple's managers, directors, executives were not able to see. He saw the future and he knew that he would build that future together with Joni Ive. Because that handle that Joni designed, that handle that was meant to transform a machine that was foreign to people then, was meant to turn it into a friendly machine, approachable by everyday people. It was a proof that Joni was sharing Steve's values and the values that Apple once used to have. In that moment, Joni Ive believed that this man who made him fall in love with Apple products back in college, this same man, Steve Jobs, was gonna make him part of something bigger than himself. And almost immediately, Jobs told Ive that he was gonna go on and work together side by side on a new project. So the reason for which you don't need to know how to code in order to manage developers is because you hire developers that don't need to be managed. You hire people that believe in the vision that you're sharing so explicitly. They all believe that what you all are doing is bigger than each of you, that you're building a product that makes lives so much better for people that they would immerse in gratitude that someone took the time and the thoughtfulness to think through and perfect a, such an amazing product for them. And that someone is you, is your engineer, is your accountant, is your assistant, and every single person in your company, every single person that owns their work and makes your vision come to reality. And to achieve this alignment, you need to build a minimum viable team. This minimum viable team blueprint is teaching you how to apply and build the operational processes just like Steve Jobs to the point where you get rid of anything that isn't absolutely necessary. See, Steve Jobs, the CEO of Apple, did not know how to code and he did not need to know how to code because he shared the philosophies of this blueprint that I'm teaching you right now. That less is more, that deciding what you should not do is as important as deciding what you should be doing. And that focus is about saying no to the right things. But let me tell you a little bit about how I discovered this blueprint. At the beginning of this training, I told you about this first portfolio of projects that I managed a long time ago. Web application and marketing campaign websites and games for Cadbury, one of the main sponsors of London's Olympic in 2012. The project manager at that time was a very senior person with a background of software development, but she was very stressed and she was exhausted. She said that if she was not gonna be assigned to a different project, she was gonna quit. It's because the pressure was so high, the timeline was so tight, and the resources were very limited that the entire team had to work a lot of overtime hours. And she actually shared with me that herself had to work on Saturdays and half the time on Sundays. I was pretty new, so they didn't even consider of assigning me to that project. 
but I volunteered. Since I was a kid and I couldn't afford what most kids had, I developed the belief that I can do anything, that if I want something, I have to go and get it. And the fastest way to learn something was to go all in, head first, no fear, and I would just grow into it. And somehow, that belief would honor me and everything's going to be okay. I'll do it, I said to the director at that time. He said, what? I'm going to manage this project. Are you sure? He said, yeah, I'm sure. It's going to be okay. One of the things that changed right from the get-go was that because I wasn't a developer, I had absolutely no input to the developer's work. I wasn't talking to them about how they're coding, if they're doing a good job. I just trusted they do. I trusted them to own their work. This saved in itself a lot of the meeting time that used to happen over there. And also, it gave a more relaxed atmosphere to the people. The developers used to have a lot of ad hoc meetings and chats with the previous project manager and accumulated many frustrations that you can imagine that they happen when you always have someone looking over your shoulder to make sure that you're doing the things the right way, the way that they think is right. She was an amazing developer though. But when you don't know how to fit these two together, you break down. In a few weeks, everybody started to feel the changes. A bit less overtime, less stress, more autonomy, more ownership. But we were still significantly behind the schedule. Still overwhelmed with how much work we were supposed to do in such a short time. Still doing overtime and still working a few hours over the weekend. I felt like I hit a ceiling. I just couldn't go over. At one point, even one of the girls in the team broke down in tears because she couldn't stand the pressure anymore. This made me feel so bad because I knew I was good at what I was doing. And this was the first time when I truly didn't see a way out. I felt like I was failing my team. I kept on doing the math. The timeline is limited. We cannot get more developers. We have a fixed deadline. It's a marketing campaign during the Olympics and we have to deliver an entire web platform. I also just had my first baby and I was away from him the whole time. It made me feel really bad because I really felt like I was starting to fail as a father already, as a husband, while I was failing as a leader of my team. I shouldn't have to struggle so hard to build a profitable product, especially when I had such an amazingly talented team. But then something happened. I was chatting with a friend of mine that was also managing product teams and essentially I was complaining to him about all the problems that I was having trying to build so many features in such a short amount of time. And he said, well, why don't you just ask your team what do they need to write code faster, to develop those features faster, and give it to them, make it happen. And in return, ask them to commit every single day that they will do the things that in the morning they said they will, and that they will not stop until it's done. I was nervous. I knew that if I was failing this, if I wouldn't improve our team's performance, my team would become exhausted and quit and we would lose them and lose a lot of money. So this is what I was going to do. I noticed they didn't like to explain every little detail about how they plan to develop the features, nor about the orders of their tasks or to have long meetings. But their face would lit up when the requirements, the features, had all the details in them telling them exactly how they need to look like once they finalize it. So I made sure that the requirements are fully describing the expected functionality, always. In return, the morning stand-ups turned from, this is what I'm going to be working on, into, this is what I'm going to get done today. I asked them to commit to their work and to show ownership. Then we adopted a lean, agile approach, building in iterations, working only on a subset of features at a time, getting the confirmations from the customer that everything looks good before we build the next iteration, making sure that the testers are not waiting on the developers and then they're testing while the developers are building the next features and showing the customer the progress so that if there's any misalignment, they would raise it right away. But one of the most impactful actions that I've taken that helped me boost the results of the team without knowing and without having expertise in their specific specialty was to work together with them on defining how will they prove that their productivity is improving. Attaching a number, a metric to what everybody was doing, like the number of bugs that one developer was generating, the number of change requests that the customer was raising, the number of requirements that didn't have enough details in them, and it would affect the developer's productivity. Because even if they realized the importance of taking ownership, they still needed to have a way to measure it. Now, you may think that this brought more stress to the team, but in fact, after everything was implemented, everyone was happy, focused, and efficient, and no one was working overtime. 
Alex was the lead tester on that team, one of the hardest working people that I've worked with. The processes that we've applied brought the best in him, and he really appreciated that. And Jania, my client, also implemented these processes and saw amazing results in her team. You may think that you need to know how to code to manage developers, but you only need to make sure that you align them with your vision. You give them what they need and you help them take ownership of what they do. It's actually a relief learning to let go and let people grow around you as you trust them more. You also don't need to hire expensive project managers to manage your developers. All you need is that you or any other member of your team to drive the adoption of this blueprint and apply it exactly as it is, to track the key metrics, to report them, and to make them visible across the company. So the right measures for improvement can be taken. Just like I promised Jenny that it would happen, that she would not need to hire anybody else once these processes are being implemented. And it's exactly what happened. Still, you may think that you need a product manager to decide the features that your development team should be focused on and developing. Instead, you, the founder, are most of the times the best possible person to prioritize what brings the maximum value to your customers and can be developed relatively fast. Earlier, I told you the story of Bradley that trusted us to implement this blueprint in his company. He took ownership of understanding the pain of the customer and passed it forward to the development team. And having the exact process on how to do that step by step becomes the most important clarity tool. It's so explicit that anybody can get results like these. Bradley says, I got an overall confidence being able to see where the company was going, and I'm able to confidently tell people that deliverables are coming at a realistic time frame, and things actually get built. And Genia says, we felt like we were finally on a roadmap making progress. Finally, they knew what was going to get built when to tell that to the customers. Now, when it comes to covering the management needs in your company, you have these options to hire a product manager and a project manager, and it's the most expensive option, or to hire someone that does both product management and project management, and you're going to save a little bit of money over there, or to hire a junior person and give them the right processes, the blueprint for them to follow. And this is even more cost effective for you, but the most cost effective of all is to have an existing staff member. And together with this blueprint, they would just apply it across the company. And this is free. Even the cost of that person that is already with you is going to be covered by the fact that the productivity of the entire team is going to be much higher. Now, let's talk about the third key. Why you don't need to beg for funding to skyrocket your revenue. I want to tell you the story about the 24-hour Le Mans, oldest sports car endurance racing held annually since 1923, near the town of Le Mans in France. It's one of the most prestigious races in the world. After none of his cars even finished the 1964 race, Henry Ford II went to Carroll Shelby, the owner of Shelby American, who was a former winner of this race himself and played in the movie by Matt Damon. Tasked with the ultimate goal of beating Ferrari, Shelby didn't seek for the most expensive engineers, but the most passionate one, which in this case was Ken Miles. So he meets with Ken Miles and he tells him the story about what they need to do. And Ken Miles says, you're gonna build a car to beat Ferrari with a Ford? And Carol Shelby says, correct. Ken Miles says, and how long did they tell you that you need to do it? Two, 300 years? 90 days. And Ken started laughing. Ken started laughing because he saw that as impossible. Now, he didn't see it impossible from the standpoint of mechanical or because of engineering, but because Ford and the entire company was known as a very rigid, a big, huge company moving very slow, unlike Ferrari, which was known as an agile one. Still, Miles agreed to work with Shelby and address the many issues of Ford's cars. When the 1965 race was close, Ford himself chose to change the engine right before the race, which led to none of his cars even finishing the race again. Ferrari would go on and win the fifth time in a row the Le Mans race. So after the race, Ford's asking to see Shelby. And as Shelby's taking a seat, nervous, in Ford's office, Ford asked him, give me one good reason why I should not fire you right now, you and your team. Trying to find the courage and the words to explain himself to the one and only Henry Ford II, Shelby said, as I was sitting there in the waiting room, I watched that little red folder 
go through the hands of four different managers in your company before it got to you. Of course, that doesn't include the probably about 22 other employees that got to look into the file before it got to your floor. So with all the respect, sir, you cannot win a race by a committee. You need one man in charge. You see, Ford had a vision, but unlike Steve Jobs, he wasn't hands-on. He wasn't laser-focused on this project. He wasn't fully committed, fully involved. But Shelby was, or he needed to be allowed to be. And he needed his own Joni Ive, which was Ken Miles. Once Shelby became in charge, the first thing that he did was not to add more power, more technology, more innovation. The first thing that he did was to remove anything that wasn't making the car faster and as light as possible. But the speed and the lightweight are not the end goals in themselves. The goal is passing that test in that moment at 7,000 RPMs, when everything fades, when the machine becomes weightless and it just disappears. And all that's left is a body moving through space and time. How you deal in that moment with that situation that is stretching you to the max, that's who you truly are. In that moment, you can actually meet and see the person that you want to become. The 1966 season was approaching and Shelby and Ken pushed the car to its limits. They knew it. They built it. And when hitting 7,000 RPMs, the car and its driver became optimum, became a lean team. Trying to keep up during the race, both Ferrari's cars broke down, failing to finish the race. And Ford crossed the finish line with all his three cars at the same time. Places one, two, and three. You know, people tend to sell themselves short so that they don't have to take the tough decisions. They fight any instinct of uniqueness, conditioned to avoid any short-term pain, even at the expense of a life of greatness. But there are a few, a precious few, who find something they have to do, something obsesses them, something that if they can't do it, it's going to drive them clean out of their mind. And Shelby was that guy. But Shelby and Steve Jobs wouldn't have achieved the impossible without following these four principles. Follow the vision, the goal, the results, not the tasks. Win the race in 90 days, nine in hundreds of years. Build the most amazing computer. Don't build the second or the third. Then build ownership. Take charge, take ownership. Always know what's going on around you. Always be the one that takes the tough decisions and propagate it all around you. Get weightless. Get lean. Remove all the inefficiencies. Remove all the distractions. Remove all the little stuff that can be delegated. Challenge the status quo. Think outside the box. Think different. And when everything is being pushed to the limit, you will be in control. Now, getting weightless and efficient is not the end goal in itself. Just like it wasn't for Ford. The ultimate goal is becoming who you were meant to be. That person that if you don't become, is going to drive you clean out of your mind. I remember when I started working with one of my clients. And after a few days, he pulled me aside and he told me, he said, Aristotle, I need to tell you something. To be honest, I don't know how we got here. We've been paying for all this staff. We thought they're being productive. We thought we're building the right things. But everything just creeped out on us slowly and we wasted all our runway. And now I had to move. I had to change cities because the investor asked me to. And I've just put another mortgage on my house just so that we can take this last shot. I poured everything in this company. Years of sacrifice. And not just me, but my family, my wife, my two little girls. We have to make it work. We have to make this work. Together, whatever it takes. I knew what he was going through. The feeling that your business is holding you back from giving your family everything that they need. And as he was sharing his situation, I could only think about Odette, my youngest daughter back then. She was home recovering from an open heart surgery meant to fix a condition that many kids with Down syndrome are born with. I remember that when she was born, she had to stay four weeks in the hospital. She was premature and she had many complications. And between her being born and up to the surgery for nine months, waking up every single night for six times to feed her through a tube, 
when she had the open heart surgery, again, we had to spend a lot of time with her in the hospital. All the processes in place to be able to take care of my family in that time, to be able to completely disconnect from work and still let it go without me properly and be with my family and give it a hundred percent, I think I would have gone crazy. To put a second mortgage on something that you believe that it's risky and there's a high chance that you could actually lose your home, that must be a terrible feeling. But he believed and he was willing to do whatever it takes. Over the next few weeks and months, we worked together and he did it. He didn't have to use any of that money. Following my blueprint, he built a minimum viable team and became weightless and profitable, self-sustainable in a matter of months. This right here, saving their money so they can own their dreams, is what I, Aristotle, have to do. This is what if I don't do, it's going to drive me clean out of my mind. Follow this blueprint and you won't need any funding. Or you'll delay it for as much as one can, given the context or the type of product or the business model that you have. And not only that, but investors will stay in line to buy into your company. I remember when I met Jenya and her husband, Eric, co-founders of Freitera, at an event here in Vancouver, BC. They were so frustrated and they really felt hopeless. They moved from California to Vancouver in the hope to improve the health of their son that had asthma. And Vancouver's air, Vancouver's fresh air, was way better for them. The value proposition for their business was at the intersection of offering the best rates in freight and the lowest pollution. So besides having an amazing product, they have the vision of educating their customers. Understanding this balance and applying these processes was key for their amazing growth and success. Now, these processes are not applicable just for the development team, but for all the departments in your company. With Freitera, we also apply these to the customer support team, to logistics, to business development, to accounting and finance, everything from iterative planning and execution to daily touch points and regular reports. I work with Eli on two different startups and blocking their operations and helping them build minimum viable teams. Eli has the most amazing combination of entrepreneurship and software architecture skills. And he really understood the importance of deciding the right things to build and how that's a high risk, especially for tech founders. And he really grasped the importance of applying these in all the other departments of the startups in the same way that Genia from Freitera did. Claude and his team are building an amazing platform for care of elderly, and he's servicing care centers. By far, he's offering the best value for the price in the industry. And fortunately, they really struggled implementing these processes as they had really unpleasant surprises uncovered. They exposed really bad development, really bad development practices, development management. Well, after all the cleanup was done, they are now one of the hottest startups in the space with very satisfied customers. You can see how we helped Mark and the IBM Watson artificial intelligence team build a platform to challenge data scientists to find solutions to big problems like wildfires. With amazing talents, they needed more clarity for all the teams that were involved. Ryan here is the co-founder of Made the Grade, and together with his wife Amanda, he was in a really tight spot, having a lot of competition. He really needed to differentiate, both from an offer perspective, but also from a marketing and positioning perspective. And we helped him with all these that gave him a lot of critical clarity. He redefined his value proposition and pivoted in his approach. Robert and I learned a lot from each other. With a vast knowledge as an investor and executive, he was really to grasp really fast the specifics of building and managing a tech startup. And he was able to turn around a very promising, but a previously very chaotic business. Sebastian here is the vice president of a $3.2 billion company. We work together to improve the project management processes and how they manage software development. All right, so these are the three keys to building a profitable software product business while cutting your costs in half. Here's the three things that we covered. Number one, how to build software products faster with only half the cost. Number two, how to manage developers without knowing how to code and without hiring expensive managers. And number three, why you don't need to beg for funding in order to skyrocket your revenue. But I really want to give you a very important disclaimer here. I've spent nine years and thousands of hours in order for me to discover, test, and apply the keys that I've shared with you. However, when I see people trying to do these things on their own or use trial and error, 
every time I see they're losing a good chunk of money. Actually, no, a ton of money. Worse yet, I've seen so many people that actually gave up on their business because that trial and error either bankrupted them or discouraged them so much that they didn't even want to be an entrepreneur anymore. So be prepared. If you're going to do this on your own and you're going to use trial and error, you're going to lose a ton of money up front. That's the trade-off between using trial and error and getting help from someone that has done it many times and has already figured it out. The idea that you're going to guess your way into a million-dollar business, it's a pipe dream. These things take work, take time, and take dedication. But the beautiful thing is that if you build your business based on these principles, your business will take very little to maintain. Ever since I went all in into these principles, me and my clients have been able to cut back so much time that we've used to put in our business. We've saved so much energy and freed up all this time for our families. Now, the major drawback in this video is that everybody's business is different and you're just watching a recording of me right now. I'm not able to actually be there with you and look into your business and see what you're doing wrong in managing your development team, see what you're doing wrong in deciding what features to build, see what you're doing wrong in defining the metrics and running your reports and the people you hire and how you're managing your operations, your focus and your product offer. I can't see those things because you're watching me on this recorded video right now. Now, if I or anyone else from our team was able to actually look in your business, we would be able to immediately tell you right away what you need to do in order to get to the next level. We would be able to look in your business, into what you're doing in your engineering team, your product offer, your pricing, everything, and we'd be able to make instant changes that would help you grow your sales and ultimately, and more importantly, your profits. But the most important of all, it would be able to save you a ton of time and money that you would otherwise lose by trial and error. Sometimes it can take months and even years to figure these things out. And all of that is time when you're gonna be losing money from the people you have to pay for your operations, for your staff, and all the other expenses. And it's also money that you lose because you're not making profits, which is a shame. Because if you really knew exactly what your customer really need and how to translate that into requirements for your development team, and how to track your engineering productivity and their progress. If you know exactly how to plan future roadmaps and plans to raise your client's interest for long-term, there would be no need for any of this struggle for you. So what I wanna do right now is to offer you just that. Around this video somewhere, maybe below, you're gonna be able to see a link that's gonna take you to a page where you're gonna be able to book a call with me or someone else from my team so that we can sit down with you, take a look at your business and find out exactly what is holding you back from getting to the next level. My goal is to see if we can help you. Your business is unique, which means that you need a unique strategy. And when we work with our clients, we look exactly into their business. We tell them exactly what they need to change and what they need to do next in their specific business. And the reason for we're so good at coming up with special strategies for your custom business is because we simply have the data. We have done it so many times that we simply know the answers. Not only we have built and managed our own products and development teams, but we have helped dozens of tech companies build products worth tens of millions of dollars using exactly the same strategies. So if you come up with a problem, chances are that we have already seen that problem. We simply have the answer and you cannot get that anywhere else but from the data. That's how we got so good, period. And that's why, to be honest, it's so easy for us to help you because we simply have that data. And that's why I'm offering you this free call so we can sit down, take a look at your business, see what's going on wrong, and see if we can help. If it seems like a good fit and you want to move forward, becoming a client will help you with everything. We'll help you with your product idea, with what developers you need to hire, what tools to use to write requirements, how to build in small iterations, how to manage developers, development best practices, customer service, your hiring, your firing, metrics, reports, and every aspect of a software business. No matter what it is, we have support for it, and we're going to help you. If you click the link around this video, it's going to take you to a page where you can tell us a little bit more about your business, and you can schedule a time to speak to us. Now, I want to be very clear. This is not a coaching call. This is a call to evaluate your business, to see if you have a problem that we can fix and to tell you what it would look like if we would be to work together so we can fix it. So if you're coming in this call with the expectation for us to help you on what developers to hire or how to manage your developers or to get direct coaching, that's not the purpose of this call. 
The purpose of this call is to see if we're a good fit to work together and do those things together. Manage your development teams, build your product roadmap, talking to your clients, and exactly how to deal with all your problems that are currently now in your business. If you decide to be a direct client, you're going to be working directly with me and my team to help you solve all the problems and take your business to the next level. Now, I'd like to be clear. You're going to be talking to me, and yes, you're going to be also talking to my team. We're here to help you in each and every week in the program. This call could be the most profitable thing you do all year. What if you would build your product twice as fast? How would your life look like? What if you wouldn't have any more hiring stress? No more desperate chasing of funding. What if you would double your sales, your revenue? And what if you would be able to take time off anytime because everything is working smooth, even if you're not there every day? How would that change your life? How much more different your world, your life would become? I think it's worth it to get on a call with us and just to see what it's about. Because at the end of the day, the difference between success and failure is the choices that you make, the decision you take. And if you choose to book this call and talk to me or my team, it could be the best choice you've ever made in your life. Now, let's be honest here. You're not going to see people going from zero to 100,000 a month in revenue without any help. It's just unheard of. You're not going to see even people going from 50,000 to 200,000 a month without any help. Everybody needs help. And that's how you get to the top and you do it fast. You learn from the people that are higher up on the ladder so that you can get higher up on the ladder yourself too. I assume that if you're watching this video right now, you're open to the idea of spending money for developers, tools, applications, and overall investing in your business. Think of it as a stock market. If you're a beginner or even intermediate stock trader and Warren Buffett was willing to look over your shoulder and tell you exactly what you need to do, or maybe not even Warren Buffett, but a really senior guy that had a lot of success, if they would look over your shoulder and tell you exactly what to buy, when to buy, what to sell, when to sell, and they would ask you to pay them 100 grand for that so they can look over your shoulder for every single trade compared to doing it on your own, would you do it? Of course you would make more money with having them look over your shoulder at every single step and trade when you know that they've had this amazing success. Whether you paid 100000 or even 200000 I'm going to be honest here. Every time when I see someone going into a tech business without having someone looking over their shoulder, I see them lose a ton of money. 10000 100000 even more. It just depends on how much punishment you're willing to take before you say, please help me. I don't think you want to lose that amount of money, nor I think you want to wait for so long to become profitable. Now, I'm not special. When I started my business, I lost a ton of money. And even in the last two years, I've lost more than 50,000 just experimenting with things. I thought they might work, but they didn't. But I'm glad I did experiment because now I know exactly what works and exactly what doesn't work. So it's very easy for us to look at your business and tell you, hey, this is what's going to work for you and this is what's not going to work for you. It's very easy for us to be very specific with you. I know this video wasn't super, super specific because these are principles that work with any business. But to really dive in, we need to take a peek at your business and that's why we need to hop on a call with you. So book a call and we'll take a look at your unique business and see exactly what we can help you with. So that's it for today. My name is Aristotle Daskal and my team and I are looking forward to help you grow your team. Talk to you soon.